Hi, welcome back with Sister Bad. You know what? This is the day that our Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you've had a good week. I thank God for bringing us back together again and for all his many blessings, all his many benefits. He is so good, so good to all of us. <clears throat> and we must, each and every day, acknowledge Him and all that we say, do, or think. And He will direct our path. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Our lives have the strength. Lord, this day that we've never seen and won't see again. So Lord, help us to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all that we do today. Forgive us of anything that we've said, thought, or done that was not pleasing in your sight. And help us, Lord, to be strengthened in you. We pray for all the sick, those who can't get out, those who are in convalescence or in the hospitals or institutions, Lord. You can go where we can. Lord, we pray for those who may be incarcerated. Let them know, Lord, although they may be in a confined place, they can still have freedom in their mind and their soul with you. Lord, we pray for all the world leaders, and we pray for every country on the face of this earth. <coughs> Excuse me, Lord. And Lord, we pray for every living person that's on the face of this earth, from the highest to the lowest. You know, Lord. Lord, we pray for the government, government of this country. Lord, you know. And Lord, just continue to help us to fight the good fight of faith. Knowing, Lord, that you will fight our battle. And that there's nothing too hard for you. Because you are control, God. You are in control. And help us not to forget that. We pray and ask all these things, Lord, in your blessed name. Amen. I just thank God. Amen. For his grace and his mercy. Just want to give a shout out to all of my friends, all of my church family, Rise and Ebenezer Baptist Church. And to every assembly that's gathered in the name of Jesus, we're all united together because we are the body of Christ. I just want to give a shout out to you and Shirley. I know you're listening. Aunt Ina, Sister Byers, so many. Brother and Sister Nelson, Brother Sister Thompson, Sister Betty Meadows. And I don't want to start naming a whole lot of names because I know a lot of you are listening. And I thank God for your support. We love you, Sister Huggins. We're still praying for you. God is a healer, a healer, a healer. And you, Sister Marie, who you recuperating. <clears throat> and we know that you're going to be all right. And you too, Vanita. Sister Marie calls her the warden. She's helping her mom. And thank God for your faithfulness. Sister Johnson, lean on Christ. He won't let you fall. And I just thank God for all, all the saints. We're all going through something, okay? But we know that this is not the end. This is just a little test we're going through. But God is able, he's able, I tell you, to strengthen and to see you through. We have a beautiful lesson today. I'm going to try to stick to the, uh, to the script. I get a little excited sometimes and we go over. But I just thank God because I want the spirit to move. I want him to take full control. I want to also say before uh, I forget, we're praying for you. <clears throat> Charlene Thompson, we love you. And we pray for God, to God for your strength. At a time such as this, our lesson today 
It's taken from Philippians, one of Paul's writing, and it's called Devote All to Christ. Devote All to Christ. <coughs> Excuse me, and it's taken from Philippians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. You know, when you say, devote all to Christ, that's, that's everything. Everything. All means everything. So whatever your problem, whatever your situation you're in, devote it to God. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're doing, to God be the glory. And when you do that, you know that you're not in it alone that God is right there with you to help you. Devote all to Christ. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. While Philippians 2 begins a new section in Paul's letter, Paul continues, <coughs> excuse me, to expound upon things considered in this opening. Paul turns his attention to issues affecting the Philippian community, their unity and humility. As Philippians 1 ends with the confession of what God accomplished through Christ for believers, resulted in a change in a charge to suffer joyfully like the imprisoned Paul. And that's something to rejoice joyfully even through your trials. Philippians 2 explains how the Philippians should do this. Paul reminds them of what they have entered into as a Christian community and what they have received because of Christ's sacrifice, delivering what scholars consider the Philippians hymn. Paul lifts up the example of Jesus drawing on the Christological doctrines of Christ's pre-existence, his divinity and humanity, his subjection and obedience to the Father, his suffering on the cross, and his resurrection to accomplish salvation for all humankind. Paul uses Christ's humility as exhibited in his early ministry as a model for believers to embrace and embody and in, as individuals for the benefit and unity of the entire community. So, Paul, in prison, is stressing, rejoice, regardless of what you're going through. Christ went through so much for us. He left royalty in heaven came down so that he can unite us back with God the Father. And our first section of our lesson will be community is created through humility and it's taken from Philippians <clears throat> second chapter verses 1 through 4. Now I will be reading the King James Version and the New International Version because some people need to hear it uh, in, in, in today's verses but we are going strictly by the King James Version okay first one says if there be therefore <coughs> any consolation in Christ if any comfort of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any bowels and mercies Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better. Mm. Repeat that. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, 
but every man also of the things of others. What is Paul saying? He's saying, if there is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Oh yes. Any comfort from his love? Oh yes. Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose and what is that to worship to serve to honor God don't be selfish don't try to impress others but be humble thinking of others as better than yourself don't look out only for yourself or your own interests but take an interest in others too. Amen. Paul begins his call to unity through humility by reminding the Philippians of what they have received in Christ. He lists four characteristics of the Christian community. Encouragement in Christ. Consolation and love. Fellowship in the spirit compassion and tenderness. Paul affirms these characteristics as the foundation of the Philippian community and exhorts them to maintain these to achieve unification. He encouraged them to agree wholeheartedly with each other by loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. In order to fulfill these commands, the community must exhibit the virtue of humility by considering others better than themselves. While Paul is calling the Philippians to unity, he is not calling for uniformity. Paul values the variety of ideas and opinion within the community. Now what he's saying is that he wants them to have unity, agree together. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's not that, okay, I'm a robot. I do what you say. Because each of us have different talents. But if those talents can work together, I may not be able to write the song. But I may be able to sing it. I may not be able to usher, but I can hand you a fan. We're still working together. And not so much that I can do just like you. But whatever talent God has blessed me with, I can use it for his glory. And I can help assist my brother or my sister in Christ along with theirs. And you know what? We used to have a little song that we sang. We would sing, the more we work together, 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 the more we work together, the happier we'll be. What I want to say, the bliss we'll be because we're working for the body or in the body of Christ. Call calls for unity, as I said, in diversity by way of humility. Individuals can and should maintain their own individuality and diversity of thought, but must be careful to avoid selfishness and personal pride that would destroy unity. Paul encourages them to place the interests of others above individual self-interests within the community. Through this type of demonstrated humility on a personal level, unity will be achieved among the Philippians on the communal level. So, whatever we do, do it for God's glory. Don't do it to say, well, you know, I 
did such and so and so. That was me. I did that. I, I, I. Me, me, me. My, my, my. You've gotten your reward. Don't let self get in the way. If someone else does something and you know they did a commendable job, tell them. We're so quick to criticize one another. Sometimes our brothers and our sisters need positive stroking. They may not get it anywhere else. You did a good job, sister, on that soul. Brother, I love that prayer. Encourage one another. Or don't go to have the mentality or the attitude, oh, they can't pray like me. Yeah, they did all right, but it wasn't. I would have said it like this. I would have done it like that. They did it for the glory of God. They did it the way God ordered it. Be happy for them. Rejoice with them. Your time will come. And if you allow God to use you, he may use you a little differently. But it would be not for your glory, but for God's glory. Amen. Our next section, we're moving along today, y'all. Humility. Christ is the model of humility. Yes, he is. And it's taken from, taken from verses 5 through 11. And it reads like this. Mm. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind? Paul is saying now, if Christ Jesus had this mind and you want to be like him, let your mind be like this. And he said, who being in the form of God, Jesus is God, y'all. He's God. But he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and looked upon him, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the church. Here I go. It just excites me. And that was, I read from five to eight, and I'm gonna break it down. What it said. And it's saying, Paul is saying, you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling for. In other words, he didn't go around <coughs> with a pious attitude. He had the authority. He could have destroyed them because he's God. But he did not go around, oh yeah, I can do this because I'm God the Father. I'm God the Son. God is my Father. But he humbled himself. And a lot of times when he would do those miraculous miracles, he would say, don't tell anybody. My time has not yet come. It means I don't want them to know who I am yet. Because I want to teach some more. I want to preach some more. I want you to love me. Come to me because of who I am now. Not because of who I am really. Accept my father. Accept the way of heaven. He could have gone around with a boastful attitude. A pious 
attitude. But he humbled himself. He didn't stay in a palace. He didn't eat the riches of food. He didn't have a horse, big white horse. But he will. But he humbled himself so that he can identify with us. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died and died a criminal death on the cross. Wherefore, God also have highly <laughs> exalted him. God the Father, okay? God also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And this is beautiful. 10 and 11 says that at the name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in earth and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to glory of God the Father. <coughs> Excuse me. He humbled himself in the obedience to God. He died a horrible criminal death and he was not guilty. Therefore, because he did that, God the Father looked on his son and he elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him a name above all other names. The, act, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul urges the Philippians to follow the example of humanity found in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ men. This is what they call the Philippian hymn. Paul highlights Christ's humility by drawing specific attention to his servant's nature. He did not use his divine statues for his own personal gain or for specific privileges, but to benefit others. Why Christ never gave up his divine nature. He emptied himself or laid it aside, becoming human so that he could reach human, reach us. Christ's humanity went to the depths of the human experience by accepting and subjected himself to the most degrading form <coughs> excuse me, of capital punishment during the time of his earthly ministry, the Roman crucifixion, which was very harsh. Very, it, was, it was horrible, very harsh. And he should not have received that, but he did it for you and me. As Christ was willing to go 
to the depths of human humiliation for the benefits of others. The Philippians are called to do to the same. Paul urges them to the same type of radical obedience and self-sacrifice that Christ's model for the world by abandoning self-interest, identifying with the needs of others, and embracing the depths of human suffering for the benefits of others. Christ's incarnation, suffering, crucifixion, resurrect and resurrection is the ultimate example of humility and is the standard for living in Christian community among the Philippians. When we think about what Christ did on Calvary, and Paul himself and Peter and most of the apostles, they suffered. The other early Christians had to suffer and even some of the old patriots, they went through some things. But Paul is urging the Philippian community that being saved is not always a flower bed of ease. But you know what? There's still joy. I don't care. And I'm saying this <coughs> from self-experience. Things don't always go like sometimes we planned it should go. And sometimes the very thing that we say we don't want to go through, we go through. We go through. And Paul is telling them that you're going to have to suffer some things. Now, you're Christian, you're saved, you've accepted Christ. But Christ paid a large price. He gave, he gave, he didn't pay, he gave a large price for us. He gave his complete self. He left glory so that we may have life and life eternity with him in glory. But he had to come down from glory in order to buy us back. And if he went through that, if he went through, oh, that's just the carpenter's son. If he had to go when he was a baby, his parents had to go from one place to the other. Because King Herod was a mean man. He was looking to kill a little baby. And he did destroy a lot of little baby boys. Up to two years old. Because he heard that a king was coming. And he was so selfish. He did not want anybody to take his throne. He didn't understand. That this throne was not of this world. He had to go through it. He went through poverty. He went through, oh, you just the carpenter's son. Who are you? He went through all those things. He went through rejection. Whatever you have gone through in life, Jesus 
paid for it on Calvary. And he did that. He became that so that he could take what we deserve. And we don't even want to do half for him. The more <clears throat> I read this word, I thank God. Empty me out and put in you, Lord. The more I read this word, the more I see that I need to do more. We don't want to suffer, but so much. I don't like suffering. I know you don't either. But if, it, if it's for the cause of Christ, then so be it. I may have shared this one time. I don't know, but it just come to me just now, out of the breath. My husband's grandmother, Eliza Ann Williams, she's gone to be with the Lord. And each time we would be around her, saintly, godly woman, she would say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And she would be talking to you. And sometimes in the middle of the, of the center, she, amen, thank you, Jesus. So one day, William and I were there visiting her. And he said, Grant, you all right? <coughs> You're saying, thank you, Jesus, and all right, Lord. He said, you all right? She says, yeah. She says, sometimes, most of the time I'm in pain, and I don't feel that good. She says, but I still give God the praise, because I know it won't be like this always. I was young. Freshly married. I was saved, but was not that mature yet. And I thought about that. And that's been, ooh, maybe 40 years ago almost. And I thought about that. Well, over 40, really. I said, you're supposed to rejoice. If you're saved, you're supposed to glory God. If you're saved, you're supposed to acknowledge God. If you're saved in all things. And she let us know that day that I'm not feeling my best. I don't feel good. I'm going to give God the praise. And I do know myself that when the praises of God go up, the blessings, and I'm not talking about a car or a new house, new clothes, or material things. The blessings of Lord, I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. Lord, I'm so glad that although I don't feel my best, I still have joy. I can look through my spiritual eye and look outside and say, Lord, I know that one day I'm gonna peel this flesh off. You're going to peel it off for me. And you're going to take out that spirit and that breath and bring it home with you. He will give you joy. Even in the midst. Even in the midst of a situation that you can't handle. He will lift you out. And he will set your mind, your spirit on a solid ground, on a solid foundation, which is in him. So Paul is stressing to them, 
You're going to have to go through some things. But learn. Learn your example from Christ. Have Christ's mind that you're going to serve regardless of what the situation is. And learn to, to work together with your brothers and your sisters. Don't just think about yourself. Think about others as well. Work together. Love together. And as I said earlier, there should not be any envy in the body of Christ. Because we have talked about it on a couple of weeks ago that we can all work together and that Christ is the head of the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone and he will make sure he's the foundation and he will make sure that all these other things, we the body, will be fitly joined together. But we have to acknowledge him first. Know that he is directing that path. And whatever your position is, that we're working it for the good of God. And we're not in it for competition or to see who can do what, but to glorify. We talked a couple of weeks back about staying in your lane. <coughs> and we want to all work. Ask the Lord what is His purpose for you. We know His purpose is to worship and to serve to honor you. But Lord, what vocation do you want me to have in your body? He will show you. He will equip you. But if somebody else come along and they may have the same, work together. Work together. And don't think, oh, this is mine. I've been doing this since the church started. Good. Continue to do it. And help someone else to do it. Because, because you did it for up 10 years, don't mean you're going to do it for another up 10 years. Help someone else to be enhanced if God has given them that talent too. There's no room. No room. We have to work together in unity. And don't put yourself above someone else. When we love, we think of others. And like it said, the Word of God said, Christ came down. He came down. He left all of that job. He left beautiful, no suffering, and nothing like that in that. He left all of that for us. And we can do a little something for him. We should ask the Lord to forgive us. Strengthen us and to help us to do better. And I know I'm going to say it again. We all are going through some things. But if you are able, if you're a believer, do a little bit more for the Master. Pray a little bit more for your brothers and sisters. Study your word a little bit more. You're going to need it. That's how you draw your strength. That's how you draw your joy. Through reading God's word. When we pray, we talk to him. When we read our Bible, he talks to us. And I want God to talk to me. So I have to read my word. And then too, never think that you're doing too much. Too much for the glory of God. Well, I went and I called and I went and cleaned up the house. 
when they got groceries, did this and that. Good. Thank you. But do it for God's glory. I did all that for them, and they didn't even call my name out. What did you do it for? Do it for God's glory. And then you'll know. You may not have recognized it, but I did it because God wants me to help my brothers and sisters and because I love you and because that's what is required of me. And that's okay. God keeps an accurate, an accurate record. He noticed. Thank God for all that you do. Do it to the best of your ability. And don't shortchange our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he went all the way. He went all the way for us. And I want to end it too by saying, don't think so much of yourself and less of Christ. Oh, I would go, but I don't feel my best. He didn't feel like it. Well, how do you know? Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he took his disciples, two of his disciples with them, to pray. Because he knew he was about to pay. You see, Jesus came, he healed, he delivered, he saved, he preached, he taught. But that was just some of his ministry. But then in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew that he had to complete his task here on earth. And the completion came on Calvary. And he went and he prayed and he asked the Father, Father, is can it, 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 I'm willing to go, but is, is there any other way? God did not answer him. Then he came to the conclusion that, okay, Daddy, it's not what I want. I got a little selfish there. But your will, what do you want me to do? Is when he paid the full price when he completed his task when he stopped dying for a few minutes and he saved one of those thieves on the cross he said then he hung his head he said it's finished and he died. But he didn't die until he completed the task. I don't want to die until my Lord and Savior is pleased and I've completed the task. None of us should want to die until we know that we have completed the task that our Father has asked us to do. Because Jesus went the whole way for us. So when you're getting in a pity party, selfish way, Lord, I don't feel good. My eyelashes hurt. My toenails hurt. I can't go to church today. He didn't say that when he went to Calvary. He said, not my will, not what I want, Father, but your will. I'm going to do what you want me to do. Let us all, please, let us all do better for the cause of Christ. 
Let us all love one another. Help one another out. Not talk about each other. But give each other encouraged words. And not only with our mouth, but in our hearts pray. And if something is not right, and your brother or your sister, instead of putting them down, pray for them and lift them up. You'd be surprised on some time how positive things done and said to people could make a difference. God took us in in spite of our ugly ways. You still want me, Jesus? Yes, I do. That's why I came. So that you may have life. And that you may have life more abundantly. I pray that you've gotten something out of this lesson. It wasn't a real long one. But Lord, it had a lot of meat in it. That'll keep you full. That you can go on and be fed. And I thank God. If you're not saved today, give him your life. He went all the way for you. He entered himself out totally so that you could come in. He's got a room for you. He has a room for you. If you're in the back sleeping way, get up. Ask God for forgiveness and get back on your job. God needs you. He needs you. And for those of us who are still in the way, pray God to strengthen us and to be able to see where there's a need to be done and give us the strength to do it. Amen. Our next week lesson, if God's will, it's coming from Colossians, Colossians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 15. And the title is Hearts United in Love. Hearts United in Love, taken from the book of Colossians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 15. And I know <coughs> that's going to be good as well. I tell you, like us on Facebook, but most of all, pray for us. And I pray that this recorder will reach the masses. I don't know. I don't look at numbers, really. Because I say, Lord, whoever ears fall on this, that I know that you would do what you need to do. I know that your word would not go and return it to you void. Because you tell us that in Isaiah 55, 11. And I just thank God for his word. Also, I want to thank Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. You're so faithful. Thank you, Kim, for your work in doing this also. My two daughters, one I gave birth to and one I didn't. I thank you, Nicole, because you're just like a birth daughter. And God bless you. Thank you, Kim. God bless you, and thank you, honey, my dear husband, Pastor William C. Brown, for making this possible. God is so good. I love you. Love you. And continue to pray. Continue to work. And continue to support God's people. And I'll see you next week, if it's God's will. Have a blessed one. Because you know what? This is the day that our Lord has made. We will rejoice, serve, and be glad in it. See you the next time. Bye-bye.